Okay, I'd like to thank everybody for listening to this video, watching this video. I have on the call with me today, I have Jim Nefferdorf from Gas Stations USA, and we both started at the same time, 1998. Uh, Jim, you want to tell a little bit about yourself and about the company? Certainly. Thank you, Harold. Uh, yeah, my name is Jim Nefferdorf. I'm a head sales associate and office manager over at Gas Stations USA. We're located in Daytona Beach, Florida, but we service the entire state of Florida and uh, occasionally we'll work out of the state, uh, generally, you know, for portfolios, uh, packages, that sort of thing. Um, our company has been in business since 1980. Uh, and as Harold mentioned before, uh, I joined on in 1998. And uh, we deal exclusively in the sale of gas stations and convenience stores. We don't do anything else. Uh, so we're a very specialized uh, niche business broker. And uh, we'll handle everything from consulting, uh, assistance with construction, assistance with finding QSR uh, resources, equipment resources, fuel supply, financing, et cetera. So we, we deal every you know with, with everything in this particular space. And I'd like to emphasize it's a what I call a high integrity company because there's companies that are out there that are realtors and then there's business brokers and they're these guys are very, very honest and I think it reflects in their listings. They tend to have what I would consider to be better listings. So but I appreciate, I appreciate that, Harold. Yeah, we, we, we do try to focus on quality over quantity. And uh, and we, we're always looking for the long-term relationship. We are not a fly-by-night company by any means. We certainly have, uh, you know, some standards that <laughs> that we uh, we like to keep in our office. And, uh, and in terms of, uh, uh, especially uh, of late, you know, real, really focusing on, on the quality over quantity um, and, and not not dealing too much in, uh, you know, distressed sites or sites that are maybe not, uh, good for long-term, you know, gas use, that sort of thing. Gotcha. Okay. A couple of questions here. Number one, and, and I understand these are going to be your opinions. Number one, sure. would you advocate purchasing a convenience store, um, gas station convenience store in a major uh, in a rural area or in an urban area? So um, my answers uh, on, on things like this are, are, are never going to be black and white uh, or absolutist. You know, it's always going to vary de depending on the opportunity and the situation. There are certainly positives to both ends and there's sort of uh, buyer personalities that will, will make one more appropriate for, for one person, one for another. Uh, talking about the rural sites, uh, generally speaking, you don't have quite as much saturation of competition, which helps with margins. Uh, generally speaking, the underlying real estate value is lower, which helps on the you know on the on the front end on the purchase. And so you know those are some pretty big positives in a in a, a landscape now where you you're really worried about heavy corporate competition. Uh, so you know a lot of times that's that's a big appeal for that sort of thing. If if someone doesn't have a major metropolitan hub, you know, sort of earmarked as a place they want to live, and they don't mind being on the outskirts or in, in uh, you know not in, in in totally urban or city centers, uh, then then it's a really great option. And uh, on the flip side of that, uh, if you're looking for something in a metro area, um, you know the benefits are you have higher underlying real estate value that that means that maybe five ten years down the line there is a uh, higher and best use as something else um which sometimes can i've i've had that uh, i'll give an example on a, a listing that i had in orlando florida uh there was a brand covenant so it it really wasn't allowed for us to to market the property for an alternate use but you know this is a site we were marketing uh as a you know pretty reasonably profitable store um the tip of the iceberg top price that we were able to get as a gas station was about 1.6 million and we had offers from alternate uses like take five oil change uh some you know quick serve restaurants coffee chains that sort of thing upwards of two million dollars so that particular site had higher value as something else as an alternate use 
unfortunately, because there was a brand covenant and a supply agreement that couldn't be broken, it wasn't really cost effective to go that route. But that's one example of why, you know, investing in something with higher underlying real estate value is actually going to be, uh, you know, a benefit looking down the road. Um, and then, you know, some of the other benefits obviously are higher traffic counts, higher roof, you know, much more in terms of uh, residential rooftops and, and traffic and everything else. A uh, bit more competition, so you really have to have your business plan locked in. Uh, you know, generally speaking, everyone, no matter whether you're suburban or, or urban, you want to have a quick serve restaurant or some sort of food concept uh, enacted. So, um, yeah, I think I, I wouldn't say one or the other is definitely better or worse. Uh, it's going to depend on the situation, and there there are certainly attributes and uh, attributes and drawbacks to both. Okay, thank you. I got an, another question, which is not on this, our list of pre-prepared questions. What are you yeah. seeing for additional profit centers where the services or products for people who own gas station C stores or truck stops? Cause I am seeing more these days. Yeah, of course. Um, well, there's, there's always sort of the, the old traditional, um, you know, if you've got the space, you can, you can lease out, uh, you know, for hand car wash, U-Haul, um, Penske truck rentals, this sort of thing. You know, if you've got some extra property, those are great additional revenue streams. It also brings some extra customers to your doorstep. But these days you also, and I'll always say the number one is quick serve restaurant. Anytime you have, you know, people coming to pump gas and, and buy from your convenience store, uh, you should really take advantage of a quick serve restaurant concept, uh, whether it be a national brand, independent, um, you know, that's going to depend on where you are and, and sort of what your involved, level of involvement is. But uh, that is just a high margin um, synergistic addition to any gas convenience site. But we're seeing now in different areas, gaming machines, we're seeing Bitcoin, um, always obviously, you know, the, the air vac, you know, machines and that sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and in certain truck stops, the gaming is, is huge, uh, you know, where they have digital gaming for, um, drivers that are, that are, you know, they can only drive for eight or 10 hours and then they have to go park for a certain amount of time, uh, gaming where they can redeem prizes in the store, that sort of thing. Uh, so yeah, there, there's, there's many, many, uh, outlets that you can, you can tap. It's just a matter of your, your operational bandwidth. You know, it's funny because I've seen some really weird stuff that you thought, and, and again, what might work on one block might not even work one block later, but we've done things where sure. people had a, a butcher shop in their convenience store, wow. a flower okay. shop. We did a deal in Texas probably over 10 years ago, and it was out in the middle of nowhere. And they started selling pies in their store, just pies, just apple pies, cherry pies, stuff like that. And yeah, these yeah. guys ended up having a very large nationwide mail order. They were sending pies all over the United States because they, you know, they 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 got people. Matter of fact, had there not been a flood in the area, they probably would still be doing it, but it got washed away. And but you know, you've seen things like pops. Is pops in Oklahoma or Missouri, where it's just a it's a convenience store, but it's got like, they've got like a hundred brands of, of gourmet soda pops there. So. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, you'll see, you'll see Bucky's, uh, you know, that, that is essentially, um, a Walmart. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. Uh, you know, with, with all, all sorts of things, uh, you know, in terms of gifts, Josh keys, uh, beef jerky, I mean, you name it. So, you know, obviously there, there's opportunity, um, for all these different, you know, profit centers, just a matter of space and time and effort. Sure, sure. Um, would you recommend that on every purchase, regardless if people are paying cash or they're getting uh, a loan, would you suggest that they get a fa at least a phase one? And if yes or no, why or why not? Absolutely, one hundred percent. Even if there was a phase one done last year, for instance. Uh, always, you know, want to get that done. I mean, generally speaking in Florida, we have a system called Oculus, which is, uh, what keeps track of all of the, uh, state department of environmental protection 
documents, annual testing, semi-annual testing, that sort of thing. And you can sort of do an informal phase one on your own by getting, you know, getting into that system and, and basically aggregating all that information. However, it is always best to have a third party perform it, give you a report. You're drawing a line in the sand uh, from your purchase and uh, in, in, in knowing what you have uh, and what you're buying. Um, and that helps for, you know, future issues. Let's say, unfortunately, if you have a release, you know, you always you can always point back to this third party report report that basically spells everything out for you uh so yes uh and the cost is minimal um in you know in comparison to the potential savings and or peace of mind so uh i mean generally speaking and phase ones have gotten more expensive i mean back in in the old days you could get one for fifteen hundred dollars maybe two thousand mm-hmm. uh then it you know stayed about twenty five hundred for a while and now we're seeing them you know sometimes three or thirty five hundred dollars but again a drop in the bucket for a purchase of a you know a commercial property and certainly you know you'd want that peace of mind whether you're paying cash or not always recommend a phase one um and that will tell you if you need to move forward with a phase two or or if you're just satisfied with that report there's a term referred to as the innocent landowner defense and i can't even tell you how many times that we've tried to do loans when there was a a a spill or release and Mm -hmm. or there had been found that there had been a spill or release and you still had an open file and sometimes they were a big deal and you know you have companies that owned it that were no longer in business you couldn't go after them uh and you know it either killed the deal or somebody had to put a bunch of money in escrow somewhere for a cleanup so it's cheap insurance policy uh, oh absolutely yeah and, and, and in almost 26 years of doing this i've only had a handful well let's say three sites that had um releases where it wasn't either covered by the state funded cleanup program or by insurance And in those instances, it's a very costly problem. Luckily in the state of Florida, which is where we operate primarily, uh, we do have state funded cleanup programs uh, that basically encourage people to report and keep track of everything as, as, you know, as things happen. But uh, I'll give you an example of of a truck stop we worked on uh, near the Gainesville area. Essentially the owner let the the, the tank insurance lapse for a period of time. They had a release and the insurance company was able to argue that the release potentially was during that lapse in coverage. Well, that's something a phase one will tell you. Uh, have they had, was there any issues with the insurance? Was there a lapse in time? If so, when? Uh, these things are really important. You don't want to, you know, step into something where you've, you've got any, any holes in, you know, in your, in your defense in that respect. So, uh, yeah, no matter how trustworthy or clean or everything that, you know, the site looks, spend the money, get that peace of mind, absolutely the right way to go. I just hope that the the flip a fund or whatever it's called is better than all the insurance companies are for all the hurricanes the past couple of years because it's... it's uh, they seem to be, yeah. Yeah, we, 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 we haven't seen a whole lot of, of real, you know, of problems with, with respect to that, uh, thankfully. Uh, but yeah, I, I, won't, I won't speak to the residential side of things because that is a... Uh, much more well, I'm, I'm actually, <laughs> uh, and this is kind of a sidebar because it's just occurring to me. I've got at least four clients in Florida that got hammered uh, with the hurricanes in like sure. in Fort Myers, Punta Gorda down by there. And they didn't have replacement value. Mm-hmm. And so what happens is... Yeah, read, uh, read your policies. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? They, they just go to, they try to get the cheapest one that's out there and it's like, that's fine, but it's like if I had a 71 Hemi Cuda and I got, you know, if uh, I might get a thousand bucks for it if I got in an, ans- in an accident, even though it's a hundred thousand dollar car. So, right. yeah, and this, this guy, he, he had to shutter a couple of his stores just because he was covered. But then he also told me the other day that one of the insurance companies went out of business. So they're, you know, they're dealing with the government trying to get it from FEMA or whatever. So it's just, it's, uh, yeah. it's spend a little extra it's tra- time. It's, it's pretty tragic. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 and, and yeah, definitely have to dot your I's and cross your T's, especially when you're looking into insurances these days. 
Here's a big important question, and I know that this is relative in terms of what are the multiples that you use to suggest how much they should pay for a site, knowing, you know, and you can do a comparison contrast between, you know, what they are now, August of 2023, and, you know, mm -hmm. maybe what they've been before on the high end and on the low end. So first I'll address this sort of the simple valuation, which is if you're, if you're dealing with just a business only transaction, purchasing the goodwill, as people say, um, without the real estate. So, uh, you know, that's, a, that's a much easier calculation. Generally, it's just a multiple of the net profit of that particular business. And so, uh, in my state where we primarily deal in Florida, uh, the tri sort of the tri-county area of southeast florida which is the most expensive and desirable area of the state the multiple is generally three times net profit so that is to say in a simple mathematical equation if you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year you're going to ask three hundred thousand for that business if you're making three hundred thousand a year you're going to ask nine hundred thousand for the business um then the further north you go uh you know that multiple gets a little lower uh, in some of the more higher, like desirable areas, uh, some parts of Orlando, Tampa, uh, you could still hit that, that three times multiple, a uh, little probably less frequent. Uh, but sometimes you'll see a multiple of two times net, one and a half, depending on this, uh, you know, on, on the area. But it also depends on the terms of the lease, um, the quality of the site, you know, area, that sort of thing. So, that's a pretty easy one. Generally speaking, the top of the mountain is about three times the annual net profit. When you're looking at properties, uh, you're going to have some of the same variables in terms of uh, what's going to give you a, a higher valuation, depending on where you're at. Uh, and that's going to be generally a multiple of the EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax depreciation, and amortization. So the EBITDA multiple can be anywhere between on the high side, I've seen 10, 12 uh, in really highly desirable areas. I sold a store in one of the most exclusive areas in the country, uh, Key Biscayne, um, and that's on that was on the higher end of, of that multiple. Uh, and then I've sold stores that are closed, <laughs> you know, that, that don't have, you know, any any real business value, and so obviously a, a multiple of profit doesn't doesn't apply. So, and, and then kind of everywhere in between. So I, I know it's not really a, a magic bullet answer in terms of, oh, yes, this is the exact multiple you're looking for. But, the you know, the truth of the matter is it depends. Um, and, uh, you know, right now we're seeing buyers that in the past three years when the market was really rolling um, that were willing to pay that 10 times multiple, maybe today they'd only be willing to pay seven. Um, and... You know that has to do with interest rates that has to do with uh maybe like a slight cooling of the market as well so you know I, a lot of those things sort of depend uh on outside circumstances but uh that's kind of my long answer to your short question <laughs> um and i know you can make it a lot longer just because it's you know, <laughs> yeah. not a quick answer what's the lowest yeah. you've ever seen the multiple because it's been lower than this before yeah yeah um you know, prior to probably about five years ago, we weren't even really working off of EBITDA multiples. Um, it was really just a site by site basis. And, uh, you know, I would say five times, you know, is probably on the low, you know, the lower end. Right. Somewhere in that range. Okay. The low, you know, the lowest. What's your thoughts on branded versus unbranded? similar to my, my earlier answers i think i think there's virtue with both um there are certain markets that are very very tough to be branded in uh and then there are certain markets that are very tough to be unbranded in so let's say for instance you're on an interstate site uh so you're dealing with unique customers uh not a lot of repeat business uh high traffic you know again not not a lot of repeat customers you need a brand, generally speaking, to draw people in. Uh, that goes for your, you know, the brand on your gas and in in your canopy, and that goes for the brand of your quick serve restaurant. Um, if you've got an excellent mom and pop concept, uh, 
but you don't have recurrent customer base, it's very hard to grow um, because you can give someone a, a, a really fantastic, oh, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, you can give somebody a really fantastic experience, but they're not repeat customers, so you're not going to grow your brand that way. Um, and then on the flip side, if you're if you're in a neighborhood, for instance, and you're dealing with uh, uh, just a, a constant of repeat customers, uh, then a brand might not be as necessary, um, gas wise, convenience store wise as well. Uh, but generally speaking, we see the unbranded. Uh, fuel mark, you know, margins kind of level out to branded once you factor in rebates uh, from from suppliers. So uh, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. If, if you have Sunoco, for instance, you might have a deal at racked price plus one penny. And then uh, you'll get a, depending on what your volume is, you might get a rebate of one cent, three cents, who knows. So you could be buying below rack. That might level out. And, and then plus it, with that, you also have a credit card base. So let's say someone comes in and uses a Finoco credit card. You're not paying credit card fees on that transaction because it's a Sunoco card. On the flip side, if you're, if you're unbranded, you might have a rack plus one deal with unbranded, but you've got no rebate and you've got no credit card base. Now that unbranded price, depending on the time of the year, could be, five, seven, nine cents difference. And sometimes it can be the same or higher. There's been inversions over the, in history, you know, where, where unbranded price has been higher or close to, you know, what branded prices are. So we find that it levels out pretty, you know, in terms of what the actual cost is more often than not. Uh, but again, that's, it's really dependent on the specific site. Gotcha. I have one more question, and it's it's related, but it's unrelated. It's not something I've asked you before. I am of the personal opinion that gas stations, convenience stores are boring. They're just boring. <laughs> you know, boring. you pull in your okay. car, and you can make really good money with boring, but, you know, you pull in with your car, you take out your rectangular debit or credit card, you stick it in your rectangular card reader, in your rectangular fuel dispenser, you walk in a rectangular door, you go to a rectangular cooler, pull out a Dr. Pepper or a Coke, and you go to the, you know, and you go get your candy, whatever you get. You buy your cigs in a rectangular packet, and then you slide it through the card reader in your rectangular card reader. I just, I think they're unimaginative. And yet, and yet, so you have to ask yourself, what makes somebody stop at your station compared to somebody else's? Now, if you're the only game in town, then you don't really have that problem. But how do you beat, you know, there's some common sense stuff of making sure it's well stocked and clean bathrooms and, and all that stuff. But what what do you suggest to people to separate themselves out to to dominate? Not just do okay, but to dominate. Well, I'll, I'll give you an example of uh, what I consider the best operators I've ever come across, the best independent operators. And this is a, a partnership, two, two gentlemen that have, that have been working together for, for many, many years. I sold them their first station roughly 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, they have uh, they have now, you know, these, these two gentlemen started off buying a business that was probably cost about $60,000 at the time. So no real estate involved. You know, they, they got the money together to buy this store. It was doing, I think at the time, maybe about 45,000 a month inside, uh, you know, starter business, buying yourself a job, essentially, you know, that there's, there's a pretty common kind of low, um, low stakes sort of investment. Um, and within a couple of years, they taken that store to, I want to say it was around 170,000 a month in convenience store sales. 45,000 to 170 a month. And I'd never seen anything like it. And it, 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 it totally blew my mind. And, and how they did it was customer service and additional offerings. And they've continued to grow that brand, um, their brand, uh, for the last 20 years. And now they're multi-site owners. And, 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 and in fact, they, they just uh, released their own franchise, um, multiple franchise offerings from a convenience store branded concept to their um, proprietary food concept and a liquor store concept. 
uh, and these guys, they're, they're, the name of their company is Nick and Moe's, uh, Nick Salem and Moe Issa. Um, really great friends and great customers of ours that we've, you know, we worked with over the years. And I've never seen anyone in, in the independent space do what they do uh, the way they do it. Uh, I mean, they have, you know, you, you don't see independent stores doing three or $400,000 a month in convenience store sales very often, you know, right. so, um, really, really impressive concept and how they did it is through, you know, working all angles of their, of their site. And that's incredible customer service, uh, great outreach in their community, you know, uh, working with local schools, uh, customer appreciation days, this, this sort of thing. Um, really great vendor relations and negotiations and uh, offerings. You know, they're, they're just hitting every square inch of their store. Uh, they are, you know, they're using to their benefit. And as I said, you know, the, the, just this year, uh, they have uh, opened up their own franchise opportunity to everyone. So, uh, you know, if somebody want, has a convenience store and it's just not, you know, it's not connecting the way it should, you can brand it Nick and Moe's. Uh, if you have a convenience store and you think you're doing well, but you want a quick serve restaurant option, you can bring in Nick and Moe's famous fried chicken. Or if you have a space where you want to do uh, a liquor store, they have that concept as well. And, uh, but again, it's, uh, you know, they built that over, over 20 plus years, uh, just on their own. You know, these are independent individuals, uh, sure. you know, that go toe to toe with the Wawa's, the racetracks, uh, destroy 7-Eleven, Circle K. I mean, it's not even in the ballpark. You know? Right, so, right. Uh, yeah, really, really wonderful concept. But that's what you need to do to set yourself apart. Um, you either have to, you know, work hard at developing that concept you're on your own or, or reach out for other, you know, other branding resources. And that that's one that I'm just, I'm very proud of because, again, they're, um, they're just, you know, normal people that, you know, did an extraordinary job in this industry. And, uh, and, and have, you know, really, uh, I've, I've sent countless people to see their operation just so they can see what is possible sure. if you really apply. Um, and not, unfortunately I'll say not everyone in this business puts that kind of effort into it, but, right. um, or no one, right? <laughs> not, not many people put that kind of effort into it, but if you do, uh, you will get, you'll see the, the return and, and the reward for it. Yeah, I appreciate that example. I, I have a quick one myself. I did a deal for a guy down in Southern Florida years ago. It was a Chevron store, but it had a service station too. And I, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of service stations. Uh, Repair bays, like uh, yeah, like use it. yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. Not a huge, not a huge fan, but I see some do real, real well. But if you don't have a good wrench you don't have a good guy or gal in there, then, you know, they can go somewhere oh, yeah. else. That's everything. But anyway, so I'm looking at his financials. This guy was paying himself almost a million dollars a year salary and, and his business was, his profit every year was, for at least for three years, was close to a million dollars. I was like, I'm used to people under-reporting, not showing much of anything for personal income, uh, sure. you know, in the store, maybe showing a hundred thousand dollars of profit at the end. But you know, I tend to get the ones that are more challenged. So I asked him, I said, what in the heck are you doing? I said, and I started looking at, I started looking at his tax returns and I noticed that his labor was easily twice as much as the average oh, yeah. store. And then he was, and then he was paying for a lot of benefits. I said, the only thing I can figure out is you must be paying your people a lot more money and you must be giving them health insurance or something. He says, he says, let me tell you, he says, I pay my people as much as college graduates. They never leave me. They never steal from me. I could leave the store for a month and not even check on it. And it'd just be ticking still. I said, yeah, it looks like you can leave. He goes, I could go to Mars. It wouldn't matter. <laughs> and so, now you can't do that every place because some areas where the store might be, you can't pay them that kind of that kind of money. 
but it no, was but a, rel- relatively you, you can and, and well yeah and ultimately you get what you pay for um if you treat people right you're going to get loyalty you're going to get honesty you're going to get integrity and, and that sort of thing and if you you know it, ultimately if you underpay or, or just do the bare minimum you know you're gonna have to contend with what that brings too but i i, I that doesn't surprise me one bit same thing goes for you know the, the folks that i i referred to yeah the payrolls you know, the, their staff is astronomical. They're they're incredibly loyal. They're incredibly talented, and it's because they've they created that culture. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, so so if, if you're going to try to undercut the people that are you know uh, really your bread and butter, <laughs> then uh, you know you, you it's it can be problematic, or or you know you you might just be part of the status quo, which which could be fine too. Um, yep. It just depends on on what your goals are. So, well, I appreciate you taking the time to be on this call. Do you have any parting words or thoughts? Uh, not too much. I mean, I, I will say in terms of, you know, if we're, we're talking specific to, to our industry, you know, gas stations and convenience stores, it is a space that has a lot of legs. Uh, it's, a, it's a space that has a lot of opportunity. It's not that complicated, um, and then, which is why I think you see a lot of new-to-industry people still getting into it. Um, you know, it just takes some vision, some hard work and some persistence and, and you can really rise above. Uh, and, and that's, the, that's the one thing that's, you know, there's still a lot of profitable stores out there doing the bare minimum, you know, and, uh, I will say, you know, you, you mentioned something about underreporting, you know, a word of advice to anyone listening, you know, if you're thinking of selling in the future, um, show every dime. Do you know? Do everything by by the book. It makes your life much easier. It makes selling much easier down the road. Um, and uh, it's it's just a it's a smart way to go about doing things. Um, that that's not to be said. Obviously, all all financials are gonna you know you're gonna have write offs and, and things that are that are normal. But um, you know our industry is pretty pretty vital. Uh, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. And uh, you know, we, we might be seeing this weird, it's kind of a inflection point uh, where interest rates are rising. Prices are still quite high. They can't both keep going up forever. Uh, I, I think um, I, I read some, some articles even, even you know, earlier this year. I think uh, Dan uh, Schmergel from, from LoopNet ha- had an article out about how, you know, how the rising interest rates were impacting, impacting like triple net retail properties, for instance, like, let's say you wanted to buy, you wanted to get mailbox money and you just want a triple net investment. Um, in those spaces, uh, you're seeing a pretty stagnant market because there's a disconnect between what sellers want and what buyers can afford. Um, and so, but these things are cyclical. They're just moments of time, you know, crest of a wave. So, uh, you know, I think uh, there's there's going to be opportunities continued. You know, uh, we're, we're going to see a lot more opportunities in the future, uh, even if the market right now is is uh, a bit more stagnant than it was this time last year. One thing I forgot to ask, which I think is really important, EVs, sure. charging points. I mean, I personally mm-hmm. am kind of bullish on them, only because I have electric bikes and an electric car. But uh, yeah. are, are you guys active? I mean, do you advise people to add those as uh, on the site if the space allows? Or because you know, Certainly. I know. I mean, if, if, yeah, if the, if the space allows, um, it's kind of a unique concept uh, because let's say you know Tesla is a great example. Um, you know, you have a supercharger station if you want to charge your vehicle, and those are the fastest, right? Right. Um, and they're proprietary to a Tesla. You see that a lot in Wawa's, uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, if there's a Wawa next to a Whole Foods or something like that, you know, you're going to have a situation where somebody can come charge the car for a half an hour, 45 minutes, and then come in and use your quick serve restaurant. So, you know, there's a big benefit to that. If you're in a rural area, um, you know, or if you don't have food offerings, uh, it, it's probably a bit of a different, a different yeah, story. For sure. But, um, I mean, I, 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 I also get questions constantly about how are EVs going to affect our industry and ultimately you know you, you still see the biggest players in in gas stations the biggest corporate entities 
developing at a breakneck rate. Um, yep. All of these, you know, all, all, and and that's an answer that that says that there's still plenty of market share there. Uh, I don't think we're going to see in our generation um, a significant enough impact from from the electric vehicles on you know on our part of it. convenience is still necessary. Sure. And the internal combustion engine isn't going anywhere going anywhere anytime soon. So. Um, yeah, in, in terms of adding charging stations, I, I don't know. I, for, for independent stores, you you might have a much better um, use of that land. Uh, car wash, for instance, uh, you know, tunnel car washes are really, sure. really oh my profitable. Gosh. And and if you've got enough space to do a line of six chargers, you probably have enough space to do a car wash. Right. Uh, so that's um, true. Yeah, that's I'm, true. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's it's the most a profitable thing to do in every instance, but there's certainly, you know, cases where it works and cases where it, where it probably wouldn't. Right. Okay. All right, Jim, I appreciate you being on the call. I'll leave your contact yeah. info in the description below. And, uh, like I said, give Jim a call if you're looking to buy something in Florida or maybe a portfolio and maybe they can help you out because they're, they're good guys and, and I highly recommend them. So, well, thank you, Harold. I appreciate it. Back at you. All right. Thanks so much, Jim. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. All right. Thanks. Bye -bye.